And now I invite you to open your Bible or your Bible app, or if you're using the Pew Bible, which can be found in the seat back in front of you, to John chapter 15, verses 9 through 13. If you're using the Pew Bible, that can be found on 1677. Again, that's John chapter 15, verses 9 through 13. Hear now the word of the Lord. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. We're going to start with a pop quiz today. And so how many of you know our four core values here at Payless Community Church? Anybody think they know the four core values? Oh, wow. We got somebody back. Karen, you think you know them? Yeah, I want you to say them if you know them. Love like Christ and live like Christ so others can know Christ. That's our, that's our mission statement. Yeah, you got our mission statement, which, which makes me happy. We talk about our mission statement a lot here. I'm going to come back to our four core values because not enough of you raised your hand on that. But we talk about our mission statement a lot, and that's what Karen got. Our mission statement says to live like Christ and love like Christ so others can know Christ. We talk about our vision statement here a lot as well. Our vision statement here says that we understand that the church doesn't exist for us. We are the church, and we exist to impact our world with the love and message of Jesus Christ. Everyone, every day, everywhere. But now, how about our four core values? Alex actually gave you a a Cliff's Notes, right? During During the offering, he said one of our four core values is to give generously. Does anybody know what the other three are? Love irrationally. Serve selflessly. Grow continuously. So we've got love irrationally, serve selflessly, give generously, and grow continuously. You know, when I became the pastor here in 2017, one of the first things that we did as a session, and the session is is the governing body of this church. That's like our elder board. One of the first things that we did together as a session was to create a mission, vision, and values statement that we would, that we would follow here at Payless Community Church, something that all of our ministries would be filtered through. And so, so we filter through all of our ideas through this mission and vision statement. We, we created those based on what we believe that God was very specifically calling Payless Community Church to in the next chapter of ministry. And you can see when you, when you listen to or read our mission and vision statements that they're very outwardly focused. Our mission statement says, live like Christ and love like Christ so others can know Christ. Our vision statement says that we understand the church doesn't exist for us, that we're the church, and we are to impact our world with the love and message of Jesus Christ. They're very outwardly focused. And, and we did that very intentionally on session because we don't want us as a church to ever get stuck only serving those who are inside these walls, who are already part of the community of believers here at Payless Community Church. We believe that we also need to be serving the community outside of these walls. We need to be telling our friends and our neighbors about Jesus. We need to go and be the church. So like I said, we we talk a lot about our mission and vision statements, but we also have these core values. And those core values 
are actually descriptive terms about how we will effectively live our mission and vision. Now, we just talked about what our core values are, love irrationally, serve selflessly, give generously, and grow continuously. But did you know that those are part of our core values statement? Let's go ahead and put that core value statement up on the screen. It says, we believe that we are better together, that relationships are the key, and together we will love irrationally, serve selflessly, give generously, and grow continuously. So we believe that we're better together, that relationships are the key. And when Session prayed about what our core values should be, one of the main things that we wanted to communicate was that they were not to be a solo endeavor, that these values would be most effective if they were done together, because we believe that we are better together. We believe that relationships are the key. Now, today we're in week two of our series that we're calling One Small Step. In this series, as we introduced last week, it's about one of the scariest words in the church, evangelism. But my hope is that we'll show that this this word evangelism is really not that scary at all. Now, last week we talked about how what evangelism really is, is, is sharing your story about how Jesus is moving and working in your life with the people who are in your world, those people that you come into contact with each and every day. So evangelism is is sharing your story of what Jesus is doing in your life with the people in your world. This week, we're going to talk about something that stops us from sharing our story with others. And it's probably not what you think I'm going to say. The obvious reasons that we don't share our faith with others is because we, we don't think that we know enough. We're afraid that maybe we won't know what to say if somebody asks us a question that we don't know the answer to. A lot of people think that they don't have a big enough story to tell, that their, their testimony is not dramatic enough. And something that I've heard a lot is that people don't really share about their faith because they think all of their friends and family are already Christian. Now, those are all reasons that people give for not sharing their faith, but there's another reason. There's another really important reason that I think we need to talk about. The reason that we don't share the story of what God has done in our life is because we don't love the people who don't know Jesus enough. I think what stops us more than anything else from sharing the story of what Jesus has done in our life is the reality that we don't love the people who don't know Jesus enough. Think about it. Is there someone that you know that you have a hard time loving? You you know that they're not a Christian, but man, if you told them about Jesus, they just might be interested, and they might then want to come to church with you, and you don't know if you want that. Or maybe there's someone who you know that that needs to hear about Jesus, but you have a hard time loving them because of the choices and the decisions that they're making in their life. I'm trying to be real with you here today. You see, we are Christian, and that means that we are supposed to love people who are broken and sinful. But how many of us find it hard to love the very people that we're called to love? And so what do we do? Well, there's some obvious things that, that we can do, right? We could, we could regularly pray about it, asking God to help us love those people who are hard for us to love. And honestly, if you're not doing that, you're never going to be able to love them. We can read scriptures that show us how Jesus and the disciples loved those who were hard to love. And again, if you're not doing that, then you won't ever be able to love them. But another thing that we can do and this is what I want to talk about today. Another thing we can do is to, if we want to learn to love the world better, then we learn that by learning to love each other here better. We can learn to love the world by learning to love one another. See, not only will we, will we learn to love the world when we get better at loving each other, but the unity and love in the church it then validates our evangelism. See, if we don't love each other in here, why would anyone want to learn about 
the love of God from any of us. See, after we encounter Jesus and we let the people see the change in our lives, the next thing that we need to do is to learn to love those here inside the church, those brothers and sisters that are already part of this community of believers. Because we'll never be able to love those outside of the church if we don't first learn to love those who are already here, within the walls of the church, within the the community of believers at Payless Community Church. Now, this is an important step in evangelism, but it often gets completely overlooked. Church leaders try to launch these outreach campaigns, and then when people actually respond to the outreach campaign, they come to a church only to find mean, grumpy, and critical people who don't like each other, much less love each other. This is why our mission statement, I'm sorry, this is why our our values statement says very clearly that we believe we're better together, that relationships are the key. And together we'll love irrationally. Together we'll serve selflessly. Together we will give generously. And together we will grow continuously. Let's look at the the passage of Scripture that Jill read for us. Open open your Bibles to John chapter 15, and let's start at verse 9. John 15, verse 9. says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. So he says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Well, what is his command? Jump down to verse 12 with me. John chapter 15, verse 12. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. So Jesus is telling his disciples that they are to love each other. Now, how do we know this? How do we know that he's telling his disciples that they're supposed to love each other? If you jump back with me a couple chapters, jump back to John 13. This is not what Jill read. She read from John 15, but jump back to me to John 13, and let's look at verse 34 and 35. John 13, starting at verse 34, says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So Jesus says, by this, the love that they have for one another, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. It's not by our our music. It's not by this building. It's not by our our children's or or youth programs. It's not by any other measure. Jesus said it's by our love for each other. We can have the, the slickest marketing campaign. You can have the most compelling preacher week to week. But if love is not present, people will not be drawn to our witness. Let me say that again. If love is not present, within the body of believers here at PCC, people will not be drawn to our witness. And one of the greatest ways that we can love one another is through our unity in Christ, being one church with one goal. Now, unity is the first step to being able to love each other, but recognize here that I said unity, not uniformity. Right? We don't all have to be the same to be a unified body of believers. We just need to be all going the same way. That's why we have our mission, vision, and values statements. Because they tell us the way that God is calling his church to go. It gives us a place to be unified together in. And scripture has a lot to say to us about unity. You don't need to turn there. Well, you can stay in John. But Psalm 133 verse 1 says this. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. How good and pleasant. See, it's good because it reflects God's heart. And it's pleasant because it it makes life together so much more enjoyable. And not everything in life that is good is pleasant. And not everything in life that's pleasant is good. But unity among God's people is... That is such a remarkable blessing because it's both good and pleasant. And there's other scriptures that talk about unity among believers. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Paul also said in Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, he said, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And I could go on and on, but if we're going to learn how to love one another, we have to be unified. And when we learn how to love each other, then we'll be so much better at loving those who are in the world. And that's why the church exists, right? It's to share the message of Jesus Christ to those in the world. We can never forget that that's what the church of Jesus Christ exists for, is that we would go out and share the message of Jesus to the world. See, some Christians treat the church like it's, like it's heaven's waiting room, that we accept Christ as our Savior, and we come here every week, or at least a couple times a month, to show God that we still believe in him so that when we die, we'll be accepted into heaven. We don't, we don't really get to know anyone around us too personally. We already have enough friends outside of the church, and so we, we sit next to each other and we check the box saying that we were here. The church isn't a place to come so that when you die, you go to heaven. So we just all sit here in the, in the heaven's waiting room waiting for our name to be called. See, churches were never meant to be a collection of isolated people. But that's what so many churches have become. That's why so many of the churches in America are dying. The church is supposed to be God's people working and doing life together. And together we're supposed to do the work that, that he is blessing. And it's not so that we can get to heaven. We do the work that God is blessing so others can know Christ. And in order for us to effectively share Christ with those that are in our world, we need to love those that are in our world. But we'll never be able to love those that are in our world if we don't love those who are in the church. Friends, we need to spend time with each other, not just sitting here in rows listening to me talk or stuffing ourselves at a delicious church potluck. But we need to be building real friendships. We need to be getting together outside of, of church events. We need to be calling and texting one another, asking for prayers, sending words of encouragement to each other. We need to have other people in our homes. The stronger that our relationships are, the more centered they are on Christ, the more we will be able to love people. And some of you are already doing this in this church, and I'm going to highlight just a few. This is not exhaustive by any stretch, but we have a group of men who meet on Friday mornings at 7 o'clock. They call their time together Fight Club, and, and those guys text each other regularly, often sharing prayer requests throughout the week. I know that our young mothers group that meets on Wednesdays, our, our Never Betters, which is our seniors fellowship ministry, the, those on the worship team, they're starting to form friendships that take place now and extend past the planned and scheduled events of the church. There's a group of, of guys here at this church that do a workout group every morning of the week at 5.15 a.m., rain or shine, outdoors. Whee! It's not a program of the church at all, but they're doing it together. That's what it means to do life together. For those of you here who are already in strong relationships with other people here, I want to challenge you to expand those boundaries. Don't unintentionally stop looking for more people to build a relationship with. If you always talk to the same people every Sunday, make it a point to meet somebody that's new at least once a month, if not every week, because we're better together. In a, a 2015 study from the psychology department at, at Brigham Young University, uh, it, it discovered that isolation is the greatest factor in determining early mortality. That, that people without a solid social support network are more likely to die at younger ages. The same is true of our spiritual lives. If we're not building strong 
Christ-centered relationships and, and helping one another to grow in their faith, then we're starting down a road that leads to spiritual weakness and death. But if we build strong Christ-centered relationships with each other, we're going to grow in our faith, we'll become good at loving one another, and that will be very attractive to the outside world. When we begin to then share our faith with others, we're likely to meet people who are isolated, people who have lost friends or, or been betrayed by people they thought were friends. Maybe people whose own families have betrayed them or, or kicked them out of the family or maybe just don't have any family left. And when we see people who, who need families, we as the church can fill the gap. We need to be a, a ready-made group of friends and family available to love and to support people who do not have that support system of their own anymore. And we'll all be better equipped to do that if we are a loving and unified community ourselves. You know, when invited to church, people often ask, well, what, what makes your church different from any of the others? Why should I come to your church? And most of the time, we try to highlight maybe how the pastor preaches or what the worship style is like. We might talk about our small groups or the amount of resources that we, that we support our children's ministry or student ministry with. But that's not actually what many people really want to know. They want to know if they will be welcome. They want to know if there will be people there that they would be able to connect with. In an ideal world, churches should all be pretty much the same at their core, but too often the thing that makes a church distinctive is its ability to love. And for the past four years, I've been the moderator of our presbytery, and for those of you that don't keep up with all the terminology of presbytery stuff, all of the the denominational churches in Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin. I'm like the, I don't know, the equivalent of like the elected chairman of the board of, of the presbytery. And in those four years, I've, I've worked with a, a number of churches who've been going through conflict. There has not been a single case where their inability to love each other hasn't been the catalyst for the conflict. In Jesus' own words in John 15, 12, Say, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. This is critical because Jesus says to love each other in the same way that he has loved us. Well, his love for us was a sacrificial love. He denied his comfort, his dignity, his life so that we could live. And that's how he's telling us we are to love each other. That we are to, to be sacrificial, to deny ourselves, to deny our own comfort, our dignity, our life. That that's how we love each other, so that others can know Christ. When invited to a new church, people, people need to know that those who are already in the church will love them. Because if the people in the church don't love them, why would they believe that the God we serve would love them? And we'll be able to love those who walk through our doors when we love one another. Let me end with John 13. I'm going to read it again. We read this earlier. John 13, 34 through 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another by this Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Let's pray.